And so we really want to make sure that that kid has a great school experience by being able to go beyond just that academic performance into more of the social and emotional help that they need sometimes. Other United Way funding will go to economic development, charitable organizations, and various health programs. For Ohio Public Radio, I'm Kevin Niedemeyer. The case against Mahoning County Auditor Michael Scortino will be heard by a visiting judge after Judge Shirley Christian recused herself from the case. The former auditor pleaded not guilty last month to 21 counts of unauthorized use of computer or telecommunications property and four counts of theft in office. Average prices in Ohio were below the nation's average for gasoline this morning, that being 277 per gallon. Oil prices here are averaging 270 in Monday's survey from the Auto Club AAA, the Oil Price Info Service, and Wex Inc. That's down 11 cents from last week. Average retail prices in Greater Cleveland are down 7.7 cents per gallon this week, according to gasoline price website gasbuddy.com. Valley Belt Road in Brooklyn remains closed as crews continue to battle a large warehouse fire there. The right lane on the outbound West Shoreway is now closed between the Main Avenue Bridge and Clifton for construction, and resurfacing begins on Prospect Avenue between Ontario at East 22nd. Highs will get to the lower 80s east of downtown Cleveland today, a little warmer to the west, a chance of afternoon storms. Tonight, partly cloudy, a chance of storms as well, a low in the 60s. Right now, mostly cloudy in 69 in Ravenna, just partly cloudy in 70 in Rittman, 72 now outside the Idea Center at Playhouse Square. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Emma, email marketing for the modern brand, featuring email marketing software, automation tools to send personalized messages, and built-in analytics on desktop and mobile devices. Learn more at myemma.com. It's the Sound of Ideas from 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream. I'm Mike McIntyre. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope you had a great holiday weekend. Now, you can be forgiven if when I say we're going to talk about dead bats, you think we're talking about the Indians after the third inning in Pittsburgh yesterday. But we're not talking about those kind of bats. You can also be forgiven if you get just a little creeped out when you discover that we're talking about bats, the night-flying mammals who inhabit caves. What is not forgivable, though, say biologist and ecologist, is thinking of bats as a scourge or a pest. They may freak you out, but they also help you out a lot. And they're in trouble right now, dying by the millions in the northeast United States, including Ohio, from a disease caused by a foreign fungus. Our aim this program is to explain what it is that bats do that keeps the ecosystem humming, what's threatening their very existence, and what's being done not only by scientists and naturalists, but what could be done by you to protect them. And for that, we turn this morning to a roster of great guests, starting with IdeaStream reporter Brian Bull, who reported recently on the so-called white nose disease felling bats in Ohio. Brian, welcome. Good morning, Mike. Thanks Good morning. for having me. Very nice to have you. And to your right, a familiar face, and in just a moment, we'll hear a very familiar voice as well. Harvey Webster is here, Director of Wildlife Resources at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Good morning, Harvey. Good morning, Mike. There's that voice. <laughs> And Glad there he is. Here. Good to have you with us. By phone from Michigan, Robin Myas is executive director of the Organization for Bat Conversation. Robin, welcome to the show. Oh, hi. Thanks, Mike. It's it's just Rob. Rob, okay. Very nice to have you with us. Thanks. And also here from Tulsa, Oklahoma, by phone, is Katie Gillies, director of Imperiled Species for Bat Conservation International. Hello there, Katie. Hi, thanks for having me. Very good to have you with us as well. You can join us too, be honest. Do you see bats as flying rats or perhaps because of Batman? Do you see their good side? I hear a lot of thoughts about bats, maybe a lot of misconceptions as well. And I'd love to have your thoughts this morning throughout the program. 216-578-0903 is our phone number. 866-578-0903 if you'd like to call us toll free. And you can also reach us via email, news at wcpn.org. You can tweet at us. At us. It's at Sound of Ideas, one word, and you can use the hashtag SOI so we can gather our thoughts all together in one place. Brian, you started with the reporting on this actually a year ago, and then in the time between that report and the most recent report, there might have been a little anecdotal evidence for the reporter out on the, literally out on the trail. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, you're correct, Mike. Um, you know, there's a lot of researchers and sources I talked to for my reporting that said it may be years before we know the full extent of the damage that's been done to the bat populations across Ohio and the nation. But when I uh, talked to um, Jennifer Norris, who's the state bat biologist, uh, she kind of outlined the entire extent that they have measured at this point, and the numbers that she gives are pretty staggering. Here she is. To date, we've confirmed it in 19 counties. And pre-white nose to post-white nose, we've seen about an 85% decline in our bat population. 
and because the declines are so significant, we likely will never have the bat populations, at least in my lifetime, that we once did, even five years ago. We're talking nationwide millions. of bats. So uh, mm-hmm. certainly the numbers aren't coming back. So what did you notice in the intervening time between last year's story and this one? Well, uh, in that time, I was out uh, enjoying a nice Father's Day stroll with my kids. We went down to one of the parks in the southern half of the Summit Metro Parks area of Liberty Ledges. And in past years, uh, before this crisis really hit, it was usually a late afternoon stroll, casual, fun, look at the plants, you know, breathe in that fresh air. And this time, as we went through in the late afternoon, uh, what was supposed to be a pleasant, leisurely stroll with the dad and his kids turned into a uh, jogging expedi- ex- expedition. Because <laughs> Got a little exercise you didn't expect. Yes, we were, because we were being um, bombarded with mosquitoes and black flies, all these critters that normally uh, we uh, assume were going to be pretty uh, sparse. But I think this is part of the fact that Liberty Ledges itself has reported about 90 to maybe 99% of its bat population taking a severe hit. Uh, an average bat can eat its weight and bugs every night. So I don't have the uh, concise well, so scientific... I, but yeah. I just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the concise scientific right. measurements, but we were really racing to get out of there, and we were just floored by almost this cloud of bugs that were attacking us. Rob, I wonder if you can uh, p- put a little uh, thought on that. That's one way bats help us that maybe you don't think about. If you don't have a bat eating the bugs, you're going to have a ton of bugs. Yeah, you know, bats are the primary predators of nighttime insects, and and many people really think that bats are, you know, really just, you know, kind of like rodents and really not good for anything. One of the most common questions I'll get is, you know, what's the biggest myth about bats? Is it that they're blind or that they'll get stuck in your hair? And really the biggest myth is just that people, you know, that people don't understand it, how um, ecologically and actually economically important bats are. And in the Great Lakes region, uh, you know, they eat more moths and beetles than anything else does. They're protecting our gardens and our forests, but they're also eating annoying insects like uh, mosquitoes and flies and gnats. Uh, so it's great. They're great for our backyards. They're great for our gardens, and they're great for you know for our forests and our farmers. Yeah, I wonder that. That's a good question. If you if you're creeped out by bats, are you creeped out more by uh, by mosquitoes and all the other night flying insects that bats take care of? Two one six five seven eight zero nine zero three. And by take care of, I mean eat. Eight six six five seven eight zero nine zero three is our toll free number. Uh, Harvey, do you think bats get a bit, despite Batman, despite my growing up thinking of bats as having these amazing powers, do you think bats get a little bit of a bad rap? Totally. And the fact is they do have amazing powers that I'm sure our experts can can detail here, but the fact that they can echolocate, that they can (coughs) explore and inspect airspace using sound, high-frequency sound, and then actually use that to find insects, acquire a signal, bombard them with these ultrasonic signals, and then home right in and grab them without using vision, that's a pretty cool deal. And the fact that they've evolved to exploit this, this nocturnal condition and to be so successful at it. And this is a group of organisms that's been around since the Eocene. They've been around for tens and tens of millions of years. I think they really rule, and and the fact that people find them distasteful is unfortunate, and a lot of it is, as you said in your opening comments, a lot of it is just misinformation or confusion because you don't understand the organism. You know, or- or maybe it's how they look. If they only look like George Clooney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an interesting image. Well, just, just one thing. You know, if you're out in your backyard and you see a big brown bat flying around, one of the things that you notice at dusk, first of all, because it's dusk, you don't see it necessarily very clearly. But then the flight seems erratic. Bird flight seems predictable. The birds are vis- visually oriented. They're utilizing those visual stimuli and cues. They kind of think the way we do. The bats are using a totally different system. So it gives them a different behavior, which seems unpredictable to us. And what's unpredictable, we become, I guess, a little nervous about. And it's too bad because they're just fascinating animals, tremendous diversity. I mean, they are the second most diverse group of mammals on the planet, some 1,300 species strong. Um, And, you know, second only to rodents. And rodents get a bad name, too. The fact of the matter is I'd make the case that all of these organisms have their place in nature. And I would add, too, that I have never been bitten by a bat. (laughs) I've been bitten by plenty of mosquitoes and black flies. Our number is 216-578-0903. Feel free to jump into the conversation at any time. And you can send us an email, news at wcpn.org, or go ahead and log on to Twitter and tweet at us at Sound of Ideas. Uh, Katie, let's talk about what's 
what's affecting the bats right now, this white nose syndrome. We're talking about more than 5 million bats felled nationwide. Yeah, unfortunately, it, it may be even more. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimated back in 2012 that at least 5.7 million bats have been decimated by this disease, but that estimate is now a few years old, and it may be many more than that at this point. So we first learned about white nose syndrome when, and what the heck is it? Sure. So white nose syndrome first uh, became, you know, came on our radar back in the winter of 2006 and 2007 when we were seeing many dead bats in a cavern system in upstate New York, and we were seeing this white fungus growing on their noses and on their ears and on their wings, and and it quickly spread from there. Um, since then, we've learned quite a bit about it. We know that the fungus is from uh, Europe. So it's a novel fungus that was introduced here to North America. It's from the family uh, Pseudogymnoascus destructus, which is a really long name that we can just we can just call it PD. And I'm uh, so glad you said native. that. I've been practicing it. I've been practicing all night, and I still couldn't get it. I figured one of you guys would say it. So great. We just say PD. It's really a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it was introduced here uh, to North America, and unfortunately, our bats here in North America they just didn't co-evolve with it, and so they really don't have any type of tolerance to it. They really don't have any type of defenses to it, and, and they really are um, novel uh, and inexperienced with it. And so that's why we decimate our North American population. So let me ask you, Rob, then, how does this fungus, uh, and I know there's been recent research, a recent study on this, how does this fungus affect the bats? What does it, what does it do that, that kills them off? Well, what we're finding is that this, uh, like Kitty was saying, that the that the fu- the fungus isn't uh, natural here, and unfortunately, uh, the bats. Um are, are really pretty much the only animals that are being affected by the fungus that we know of so far. And it's because they are the, you know, the, the mammals that are going in to hibernate in these caves. And then when the fungus grows on them, it, it, uh, really digs into their, uh, their skin. It's really affecting their metabolism. It's actually eating away at their skin. Uh, but it, basically what it does is it wakes them up too many times. It's really wearing them down and they end up, uh, waking up looking for food. Uh, before the winter is over, and this is when when people are seeing the bats. You know, if you live near a cave or a mine with uh, white nose syndrome that's been affecting the bats, you'd be seeing the bats flying out in like February or March, and it's still snowing, and there's no food for them to eat. And as I understand it, the waking up and going back to sleep because it's hibernation time, they're supposed to use very little energy when they wake up. Uh, repeatedly, their metabolism kicks into gear. They burn all those fat stores, and then they're in big trouble when it comes time to either finish through the winter or when it's done, trying to go out and forage for food in that weakened state, as well as you know, what the fungus might do to the to the wings. And some of them call it like itching and scratching syndrome or something. They're waking up and and going back to sleep. It's amazing that that's enough. But when we talk about the numbers, there there have been uh, biologists and investigators that have gone into caves and they just literally see tens and thousands of these bats in. Miles. Well, you know, we probably have another issue as well going on is, is really the overuse of pesticides, uh, you know, chemicals building up in, in, uh, potentially in the bats themselves, making it so that they have a hard time dealing with uh, uh, this invasive uh, fungus. And then the other thing is, is just the, in, the, the quality and number of insects themselves. Uh, so the bats are also probably going into hibernation, uh, not having the necessary food stores uh, available so that they can, uh, you know, last a, a, a long period of time and still be able to fight off this fungus. It's one thing to say bats have a bad rap and we ought to just think better of them. Folks like uh, our guest this morning uh, try to educate us on that. But when, when it really comes down to reality, sometimes that's tough to do. And Greg in Cleveland Heights is joining us for perhaps a, a thought or a question on that. Greg, welcome to the show. Oh, yeah, I agree. The the, the perception is, I think, almost kind of a moot point because I've, I've, we've had as many as uh, almost a dozen bats in our in our house over the course of the summer. Sometimes, and it, at that at that moment that that's happening, you're you're more concerned with getting it either out of your house or how do you remove it from your house? And just the sheer volume of it at some time, it's, it's like I can't afford to call the the, the the pesticide people to come out every you know every other night to, to remove a bat from my house. Plus, we've even had a situation in our house where they 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 we were able to seal up the area where they were getting in well enough now that they hang out underneath the rafters and there's a whole section of my house about 10 by 20 where there's nothing but white streaks down the side of my house you know i have to go out and you know clean that like almost 
you know, weekly, you know, and, and, and it's not easy. And it, it was, a uh, and we just had the house painted like a couple, you know, like a, a couple months back too. And it's just really frustrating. I understand the significance, but it's easier for me to get flies out of my house than it is bats. <laughs> you know, I know someone uh, in my neighborhood who opened a closet to see a bat, closed the closet and immediately went to a hotel. That was it. <laughs> We're done. And I wonder if you had that many bats. I, I'm sure there was. Uh, you probably did a little shrieking in your house as well. It's a little. It, it does freak you out a little bit. So let me ask. Stay on the line with us, Harvey. If you have a bat in your house, it's likely in in these parts. What kind of bat? Well, oftentimes, uh, big brown bats are apt to um, uh, roost in in attics and eaves, and they they take quite readily to human structures. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you find yourself in the same airspace as a bat, um, if a bat's flying around a room and you're in the room, you actually don't want to be in the middle of the room. You want to be against the wall, give the bats some flight space, and then if it lands somewhere, you can, I mean, a neat thing, if you've got a large can, plastic can or metal can, is you can just put it over the bat on a wall and then slide a piece of cardboard gently up because you don't want to hurt their their um, the their wings or their their feet, and then you can just take them outside and let them go. But but that whole idea that if sometimes people stand in the middle of a room and the bat is it, it encounters you using echolocation, it then has to dive to make a quick move away from you. In doing so, it's it's losing steam. It's just a, a good thing to stay against. The wall, remain calm. Right, it's so easier said just, than done. And just because the worst thing you can do is, if you actually want to remove the bat, is that if you close the closet door and go to the hotel, you have no idea where in the house the bat is because maybe the bat's going to slip out underneath the crack of the door and oh, end up somewhere else. <laughs> so okay, so so that's one solution. But but here's Greg who has bats in his house. They repeatedly get in. He seals it up. Now they're still hanging out on the eaves. He doesn't want them. So is there a way to get rid of well, bats and not be mean to bats? Well, a couple things. So you know the. Going back to if they're in the house, you know, you can if you can get them that way, you can certainly open up windows while or doors while they're doing that flying to get them out. Um, if you've got an older house and you've got cracks, you know, the bats can slip into a crack that might only be three eighths of an inch to a half an inch in, in in width. So it doesn't take much for them to find some little entry point and a nice little cozy spot within your house. So doing an audit of the exterior of your house and looking for those spots, oftentimes if there is a spot that's active lose by bats, you'll see a brown stain beneath it. Not white streaks, but a brown stain, which is from the oils of their hair. That's a telltale tell marker. And there are ways that you can create an excluder where the bats can leave because they can't back in, get back in. And I would say that Greg has a perfect opportunity to install some bat houses in his yard and encourage the bats to move into their own domicile as opposed to his. There you go, Greg. Get your hammer and nails out. <laughs> Mike, I also wanted to add, um, one of your guests brought up pesticides a short moment ago, and one of the uh, self-perpetuating problems we're going to have as the bats decline is that with fewer bats, there's going to be less pest control. And there was a report in the journal Science four years ago that said, at least for Ohio, Jennifer Norris quoted this too, that bats basically save farmers uh, at least $22 billion in pest control. That may be across the region, not just Ohio, but as we see the bats decline, we may see the use of pesticides increase, which in turn provides a problem for those surviving bats. So that's just something to watch and track for. Yeah, I think she put that number at a couple, a couple uh, in Ohio, but 22 uh, across uh, across the nation. Uh, excellent points, Greg. Uh, what what about building a, a bat house? I don't know about that, and, and we did come up with the uh, the box and board method pretty pretty quickly after after three or four bats uh, one one summer. But the, the the thing we did was we did we did uh, spend a lot of money having uh, pest control people come out finding the the cracks and putting on a new cage on top of the the uh, the fireplace and and we looked everywhere we couldn't find them we finally found out where they were coming in you know, uh, you know on our own well after we spent a lot of money you know with the with the uh, the the, the uh, pest control guys coming out but what, the one of the pro the problem we have now is when the, the last time we had the house painted we had every one of those cracks double sealed reinforced you know like everything we possibly could do. And now we've got, like I said, we've got this whole area where we get nothing but these white streaks coming down. So we've already we've already done the ceiling. We've already looked all over the place. We checked the, uh, I checked myself all the way through the attic, and, he, and he's inside the house. There's really no place where they're where they're congregating. There's no smell. We can't find anything where they're where they're living in the house. If they're getting in the when they're getting in the house, they're pretty much, you know, coming down. You know, coming down the rafters as the night, you know, as it cools, as I understand it. 
and then uh, and then then coming out to where we're watching you know TV where the noise is. I, is, is, is what I was told. Okay. Yeah, so that's when, when if they're getting in that you know when and, and we have we've had a lot less of them after we had the foam injected insulation put in the wall. So that cut it that cut it down considerably, but I'm not sure if that cut in, cut down the bats getting in or right. cut down the bats being able to get out. Okay, Greg, uh, thanks a lot for the call. And uh, clearly, there are frustrations uh, for for homeowners. Uh, pretty rare, it seems, uh, comparatively. Uh, we're going to uh, take a break though and come back and talk about the uh, the serious issue too of of white nose disease, specifically what's being done about that, how it spread. Jim and Shaker Heights is going to join us as well. He's got a question that's right on point about uh, some of the concerns about how this fungus is being spread. Uh, I want to say thanks to you, uh, Brian Bull, for kicking us off this morning, giving us an idea for the show, and I'm sure you'll be revisiting this topic next year after a nice Father's Day walk. <laughs> Absolutely, Mike. Thanks right. for having me today. We'll take a quick break. The rest of our guests are remaining with us. It's the Sound of Ideas. I'm Mike McIntyre. Back in a moment. Support for 90.3 comes from the Cleveland Transformation Alliance, a public-private partnership dedicated to ensuring that every child in Cleveland can attend a quality school and that every neighborhood has great schools. More information on all Cleveland district and charter schools can be found at clevelandta.org, where Clevelanders can choose their school and change the future. The Cleveland Transformation Alliance, quality schools for all children. Support for 90.3 comes from Regency Roofing Shake Masters, a family-owned and operated custom roofing contractor specializing in cedar shakes, stone-coated steel, designer shingles, and copper roofing. More information on the web at regencyroofingohio.com. And you are back with the Sound of Ideas, about 9.27 a.m. We're talking this morning about bats, about an existential threat to bats, white nose disease. And love to have your thoughts this morning, 216-578-0903. We've learned in the first part of this hour that bats maybe get a little bit of a bad rap and that they are endangered now, not an endangered species necessarily, all of them, but uh, but they are endangered by this uh, fungus of more than nearly 6 million, and perhaps much more than that based on uh, newer numbers have died off because of this white nose disease that's caused by a fungus, a foreign fungus. We're learning a little bit more about that this morning. 216-578-0903 is a way for you to get through and join our conversation. With me by phone from Michigan is Rob Myas. He's executive director of the Organization for Bat Conservation from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Katie Gillies is with us, director of Imperiled Species for Bat Conservation International. And here in Studio 4, Harvey Webster, director of wildlife resources at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Uh, one quick thought. Harvey was mentioning this during the break. A fellow that called and said, we're having trouble with bats getting into the houses. It's a different issue than white nose disease, but it's one that's on people's minds about how we interact with bats and think of them. Uh, your suggestion was to build a bat house. You were noting that both of these organizations that our guests are from give you lots of information on how to do that. Right. I don't need to speak for them, but both Rob and Katie's organization, the Organization for Bat Conservation and Bat Conservation International, have fabulous um, resource-rich websites um, on on how to to coexist with bats, and I, I won't speak for them other than say go to those websites. They're great, and not just the websites. We've got the experts with us, and uh, Katie. Uh, uh, beyond the the issue of white nose disease, and, and and we'll talk in a minute about how we might interact with bats in a way that doesn't bring disease to them. But the way people interact with bats sometimes is always crisis, as we've heard from from our caller Greg. What kind of uh, advice and and uh, counsel can organizations such as yours give? Well, you know, I, I, mean, I can certainly relate to the frustrations that your caller had. Um, I, you know, I guess the, the best thing that our organizations uh, can suggest is education and tolerance and things like that. I mean, I think your caller had a maternity colony probably living in his attic, and so that's where, you know, the mother... Um, they get pregnant. They many mothers come together. They get pregnant, and and they have their pups there, and and they're really very loyal to this site year after year. And so that's why he would find year after year the best coming back to it because whatever um, his attic was providing the the right temperature, the right humidity, the right location to critical resources, it's all right there. And so they they would just keep coming back and back to that site year after year until you find a good way of excluding them or attracting them someplace else, like like Harvey recommended with the with the bat box, but. I think the more people learn about bats and they, the more they learn about what they do for us in the environment and uh, and how cool they are ecologically, I think that they'll just develop better appreciation for them. And by the way, bats are not, not all bats. In fact, only a few species are vampires. We also have that idea. Uh, bats are yeah, not vampires. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Here in uh, North America, well, so there are only three species of bats that are vampire bats in the world, and uh, two of them specialize only on birds, and only only one species uh, specializes on mammal blood, and and really that's in Latin America, primarily you know in Mexico and Central America, and and mostly they they feed upon you know cows because they're very easy targets out there in the field, and and they have very very little interaction actually with uh, with humans, but of course when when they do it, something that you should be cautious of. But but we don't have vampire bats up here in North America. In, in, in the U.S. And speaking of vampire bats, that's one of the other cool things that bats brought us, which is the idea of this anticoagulant, so that they could have a nice, fresh, uh, you know, unclotted pool of blood to feed off of. Well, because of that, uh, we've learned a lot our own selves about uh, of anticoagulation, uh, just as we have about uh, about the the uh, sonar system that bats have as well. So interesting, uh, lots of things that they can teach us. Let's uh, let's move on to uh, Jim in Shaker, who I mentioned was calling about uh, perhaps what might be spreading the fungus that is uh, bringing this white nose disease. Jim, thanks for calling. Yeah, thanks. Great great conversation. Uh, so I went to graduate school at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia, and there was a lot of folks, a lot of folks that did uh, you know spelunking or caving. And gosh, I was there back in the early 2000s, and that's when I felt like I first heard about this thing, white nose fungus. And I'm wondering, I've never read anything about it, but I'm wondering if your experts on this show uh, could comment on the possibility of cavers being vectors for some of this thing. Because I have a sneaking suspicion that some of the spread of this white nose can be explained by the uptake in caving and these folks going into these deep caves and bringing stuff from the surface. Is there, is there any comment on that? Rob? Uh, well, um, we don't know for sure. Uh, one of the things that we have to assume, though, is this uh, invasive species came from Europe. Uh, the, 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 most of the information shows that it was in Europe well before it was in North America. Uh, how does a fungus get across a, uh, you know, an ocean? Uh, most likely it was by humans. Is it spread, uh, once it was here, was it spread from cave to cave? There's a possibility, but we, we do know that bats, you know, are highly uh, mobile as well. They can easily fly multiple states in a season. Um, we've learned a lot over the last 10 years about their migration because we've been putting a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out how, how bats might be spreading this fungus. Um, so is there a possibility or a probability that humans are spreading it and bats are spreading it and maybe even a whole other uh, avenue for spreading? Yes. Uh, so we, we definitely we look at that. Uh, there's been a lot of states and even federal agencies who have uh, uh, closed off uh, caves and mines uh, to the public uh, to trying to keep the fungus from being spread that way. There have been some others, too. Mammoth Cave, for example, where there's a, basically a long astroturf-like carpet. you got to wipe your feet, basically, before you come in. There are others that have requirements. You can't come to this cave if you've worn any of that clothing or taken any of that equipment into any other cave since 2006. So you've got to have fresh clothes to do it. So certainly there is some suspicion or concern that the spread can be caused by you bringing it in and tracking it in. And that's kind of a, I mean, for somebody that wants to get up close and see these types of things, Harvey, uh, just like you climb trees to look at eagles' nests, etc., you've got to sort of balance those things about whether you're doing some harm. You definitely do. And, and the fact is, is that, as Rob pointed out, if, 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 if there's not a definitive um, causality about humans transferring the virus, if the fact you've got this, you know, systemic collapse of bat numbers, then we need to be as cautious and protective as we possibly can. And that, you know, oftentimes we do like to enjoy natural resources, but it's important that we don't um, love things to death. Um, and, you know, we can be unwitting agents of the transmission of all sorts of novel pests and pathogens. There's, history is replete with that, and, um, and, and that's a, that it's a real concern. It's something that people should take, um, take into account when they visit these places. I'm looking at the instructions from the National Park Service for Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. It says that um, uh, on the remote chance you might come into contact with GD spores, uh, PD spores, they shorten it to, uh, to, a, to the G uh, from pseudo. Uh, during your tour of Mammoth Cave, all participants 
in the Mammoth Cave National Park, cave tours will be required to walk the length of an artificial turf mat to remove spores and dirt after exiting the cave. We also ask for your cooperation by washing your hands and changing clothes and footwear before visiting any other caves or mines. And then it goes on very bluntly to say, if you can't do this stuff, we'll be happy to give you a refund. So they are getting serious about who goes where and what they might uh, be spreading. Let's take another uh, phone call here. Uh, this is uh, Scott. And by the way, you can call too. 216-578-0903 is the phone number. Scott is joining us now from Oberlin. Hey, Scott. Howdy, folks. This is a very interesting conversation. And we've uh, we've got an older home, and I've, uh, I've actually become quite expert at catching bats and everything. And you're right. If you stand at the side of the room... And then reach out with your net. You can you can uh, net gently uh, the little critter and then take it outside. And it's really it's not a big deal. And uh, but my question here is like we've got this white nose uh, fungus that's that's killing the native bats. Where the uh, the fungus originated in Europe are the bats there um, immune to the fungus. And is there, has anyone thought about the possibility if we are seeing like over 95% loss of the indigenous bats re- are introducing a, a fungus resistant bat here to take up that place in the uh, scheme of things? Two good questions. So, first of all, we don't know specifically where this fungus came from, do we, Katie? And, and do we notice uh, this? white nose syndrome fungus problem in in other places or is it just because north american bats aren't aren't used to that fungus sure so so we do uh have some information on that we've been working with several partners in europe to kind of narrow down where we think in europe uh, this fungus came from and some recent research came out just a couple of months ago that uh using molecular markers demonstrates that it most likely originated from central europe probably in germany or poland or luxembourg and the researcher that's working on it is actually taking a, a full genomic step next, and, and hopefully we'll be able to narrow it down even further at this point. So we are uh, kind of closing the news on that, trying to figure out where exactly it came from. But we don't see the loss of bats in Europe like we see here in North America, mostly because uh, the PD fungus has been present on the European landscape for many thousands of years. They've mapped the, the genome for the fungus in Europe and the fungus here in North America. And there's a great amount of variety in the genome in Europe, indicating that it's been there and it's been evolving and it's been collecting a lot of variety for a very long time. Whereas here in North America... There's almost no variation, no matter where you take your samples from, whether it's right there in New York or in Ohio or um, down in Tennessee. It doesn't matter. There's very little variation indicating that, you know, it was a a point source introduction and it just hasn't had the time uh, to differentiate. So our bats are responding differently because they just haven't been exposed to it for very long. They've only been exposed to it for the past, you know, nine years. And so they haven't had any opportunity to respond or, or adapt to it at all. Whereas in Europe, it's been present on the landscape for, you know, probably thousands of years. As for the question about introducing um, fungus-resistant bats, that's a real, real tricky thing to navigate, right? We don't want to introduce non-native bats from Europe here into North America. Um, we've, we've, you know, we've done a lot of that in the past, like look at European starlings. We've introduced um, species from all over, and they essentially just become pests. So it's not going to uh, help us actually to introduce a new species of bat from Europe here to North America. What we want to do is try to protect our bats here in North America so that they can respond and rebound from this. Um, Although what Jennifer Norris said uh, previously when, when you open the, 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 the conversation here, um, we're not going to see a response in our lifetime. We're just not. They're too long-lived. They don't reproduce quickly enough. And the, the disease has been far too devastating. Um, but we are working on different types of ways, ways probably to manage the fungus. And, and we hope that North American bats will be able to um, develop some sort of resistance over time. Unfortunately, it's just going to take a really, really long time to do that. A couple of quick points on that. In, in one uh, instance, there is some encouraging news uh, in Smithsonian uh, in January, a story that said that uh, researchers were surprised that some bat colonies might be beating white nose syndrome because they assumed that by now they'd be essentially all but gone, but are seeing some rebounds in numbers. So perhaps it's one of those things that maybe it kills off at the very beginning and resistance is being built up themselves. Is there any hope of that? I would certainly say there's a lot of hope. I would say wildlife biologists that, that work on this are nothing if not hopeful. Um, 
But, you know, we're, we're talking about with some species, you know, and in some locations, 95, 99% loss. Um, and, and so, yeah, there, there may be a handful of them left, you know, in a cave or left in, in a portion of their range, but they may be below a threshold where, where they're able to, to reproduce and rebound from that. We just don't know. It's really, we're right in the thick of things right now with the disease and trying to make predictions about what's going to happen after it's made this initial sweep through. We really don't have enough information to make those predictions just yet. 216-578-0903 is the phone number. Boy, when you hear 95% of a population, I mean, even if you don't know anything about bats or uh, not much about uh, biological research, 95% is a whopping number. Uh, Rob, what about research that's being done? There was a question about introducing bat uh, species that it might be resistant to this, but as I understand it, there's been some research going on and a call for more uh, to, to sort of create perhaps some some cures for this to, to make some bats perhaps immune to this. Do you know anything about that? Absolutely. You know, one thing we uh, we do want to be careful about using is, uh, it, and it's just probably something common that we use as humans, we say cure. Uh, th- we're definitely not looking for a cure for the fungus. Uh, we're, we're looking at management uh, tools, um, and a variety of management tools uh, are already, have already been created. Uh, so uh, we do know how to kill the fungus, especially in the laboratory. Uh, some of the some of the um, you know the techniques are 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 also also dangerous to the bats. So we're looking at uh, obviously we're looking at ways to uh, control the fungus or e- or even just uh, reduce the the um, effect of the fungus, even if the fungus exists in the caves, which it may always exist here in North America, there might be a way that we could treat it so that the, that the bats could just still live with it but not die from it. So there's been a bacteria uh, that's had some great um, uh, possibilities uh, as one of our treatments. Uh, bacteria is a natural uh, enemy to uh, to fungus, it's an it's an antifungal, and uh, this bacteria actually is used on our uh, fruit. So, like uh, bananas and and other types of fruit, uh, the, the bacteria is just uh, in the same airspace, and it, it and it keeps fungus from from growing, mold from growing, and uh, this shows some great promise. Uh, and right now, as, as Kitty was saying too, we're kind of right in the thick of taking what we've learned. Uh, both from Europe, from the United States, what we've learned in the lab on how to control the fungus or at least reduce the fungus, and now we're ready to start uh, attempting some of this out in the field, and that's where we're really going to start to see what works and what doesn't. Some of the detail on what you were just talking about, which has so many people excited, it's Georgia State University uh, that's been doing the research on this, actually involving uh, the uh, Mark Twain Cave Complex in northeast Missouri, and they took bats from there and then uh, treated them with this bacterium that you're talking about uh, that it reduced the fungal burdens on uh, bananas. So they were saying, okay, so there's less fungus on bananas. And the researcher on it, uh, Chris Corneliuson, uh, Cornelison, sorry, postdoctoral research associate at Georgia State said, it came to me that if this bacterium can inhibit the growth of mold on a banana, there's a shot that it can prevent the growth of mold on a bat, perhaps just essentially making it Teflon to this, uh, to this kind of uh, mold. That's one of uh, the many bits of research that's being done. But I wonder, Katie, if enough research is being done, I think the answer is always no whenever you talk to researchers, but are there, are there multi-pronged attacks on this, or, are, is it, or is it, do you feel as though it's just uh, sort of monitor and hope at this point? Oh, I definitely don't think it's just monitor and hope at this point. Uh, I, I think that we have really turned the corner. You know, we took years of establishing just basic research and identifying what this fungus is, where it came from, how it works, before you can then take that next step and trying to figure out how you can manage it and treat it like Rob was saying. And we are looking at many, many different types of tools in our toolbox. We know there's not going to be a single silver bullet that's going to be able to manage this. And so... We're looking to develop many different types of approaches. And uh, the, the bacterium that you're talking about at Georgia State is certainly very promising. It's, uh, you know, it's something that's been in development for several years. They've seen success on it um, on bat wing tissue in the lab as well as uh, live bats in the lab. And this past winter, as you mentioned, at Mark Twain Cave Complex, they, they tested it in the field. And although they're, they're still getting the results from that, they, they feel that it, you know, the initial results are very promising. But there are many other different uh, research groups that are looking to develop other tools. In addition to the work at Georgia State, 
which is partnered with the U.S. Forest Service. There's also the University of California at Santa Cruz has been working on another bacteria in the Pseudomonas family, and they've been working um, on that in the lab, too, and they've shown some initial success, again, on bat wing tissue and then on bat wings, uh, excuse me, on live bats in the lab. And so they are looking to try uh, uh, an initial field trial here soon on live bats in the field. There are also other teams that are looking at other types of management, such as gene silencing techniques or using mycoviruses, you know, something that can be used uh, and passed down uh, without having to do repeated treatment. These two bacterial treatments are something that are probably going to have to be done at sites every single year to manage the fungus. And, and one of the things that we would also like to develop is a tool that bats can then pass among themselves to manage the fungus internally. And that's where we're looking at maybe gene silencing or some of these mycoviruses. But everything is in the very initial stages yet. Some projects are a little further along than others, but as a community, the development of treatments, it's really, it's just turned the corner. We're just starting to figure out ways to do that now that we understand the fungus well enough. We're going to take a quick break right here, our last of the program. We're going to come back and continue to discuss this problem, White Nose Syndrome, which is in uh, 26 states, five provinces, 19 Ohio counties. Certainly a widespread problem, one that we're learning uh, biologists are trying to get a handle on. Love to have your thoughts at 216-578-0903. Robin from Medina County is going to be joining us, joining us right after the break. You can too, 866-578-0903, or send us an email, news at wcpn.org. It's the Sound of Ideas. We'll be right back. Youth Opportunities Unlimited presents an evening with Roberta Flack and Peebo Bryson at the State Theater on October 30th through Academic and Career Services, YOU empowers youth to succeed. Tickets for Roberta Flack and Peebo Bryson are available starting this Friday at PlayhouseSquare.org. Support for 90.3 comes from the new Cleveland campus of the Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine in affiliation with the Cleveland Clinic training primary care doctors to practice where they preach and bring vital care to medically underserved communities in Northeast Ohio. More information is available at ohio.edu slash medicine slash Cleveland. In his latest novel, writer Michael Shabon takes us to Oakland's Telegraph Avenue, where two couples, one black, one white, try to hold on to their friendship as the world they share falls apart. Today on The Sound of Applause, at 2 and 10 p.m., from 90.3. It's The Sound of Ideas from 90.3, about 9.47 a.m. Coming up in the next hour, voters said no to austerity measures required for the Eurozone's big, fat Greek bailout. That drives a wedge between Greece and the rest of Euro the European Union and brings up the question, what now? Diane Rehm and her guests speculate right after the news. And tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, rain is back in the forecast today after a mostly dry holiday weekend. The sunshine was a welcome relief from the eight and a half inches of rain recorded for Cleveland in June, the third wettest month on record in Northeast Ohio. That much rain will have lingering effects, and we'll dive into those tomorrow. Right now, we're talking about bats, the kind of patrol the night skies. They're under serious threat in Ohio and 25 other states. With us at the Idea Center is Harvey Webster, Director of Wildlife Resources for the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And Idea Stream's Brian Bull was with us a little bit earlier as well. By phone from suburban Detroit is Bob Myas. Uh, Rob Myas, sorry, he's the Executive Director of the Organization for Bat Conservation. And from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Katie Gillies uh, of Bat Conservation International. If you'd like to go to our website, wcpn.org slash SOI, you'll see links to those organizations. As Harvey said, they're very thorough and very complete. Give you some advice not only about white nose disease, but interaction with bats in general, and even how to build a bat house. Uh, you can get information about that there. If you'd like to join us, 866-578-0903 is a way to do that, and Robin is joining us now from Medina County. Hello there, Robin. Hi. Good morning. Morning. I just caught the uh, show not at the beginning. I caught it uh, at the tail end of somebody having a problem with bats, and I, I started wondering if they ever relocate bats because we'd love to have some here. We live on a farm with two ponds, and we used to watch them come out. They were prolific at dusk, just feeding on mosquitoes and it has been years. They they declined and declined, and now we haven't seen a bat in years. I thought I saw one recently, but it was a barn swallow. They have a similar type of a wing. So, so how about that? Bats wanted. Could, do you ever relocate bats, uh, Rob or Katie? Is that something that's done? 
Well, um, we do relocate bats. They tend not to relocate very far. And this is the, kind of going back again. I know that all of us have brought this up so far, but uh, Greg, who was calling in earlier, you know, the biggest problem for those bats is the lack of places sometimes to live. And that's why they end up in people's houses. You know, older homes and stuff like that do have all those extra cracks and crevices. But if you don't provide them alternatives, uh, they'll either continue to live in the house, go to your neighbor's house, or just leave the area altogether. So putting up bat houses is really important. Um, you know, our organization has a great Save the Bats campaign, and one of the key things really is is about trying to empower people to do things in their backyard. But providing bats safe places to eat and live uh, are really important. So. Uh, native wildflower plantings. You know, we've. We, I'm sure on the on the show you've talked about how bees and butterflies are disappearing. Well, bats are disappearing as well, and and there's there's probable links between uh, all these types of backyard animals disappearing. Uh, so native plantings help help bats out. They provide a lot of food uh, for them at night, providing bat houses for them, and especially you know education across. Um, you know, your neighborhood and your community, um, then neighbors aren't killing bats and other neighbors are hoping for them. But unfortunately, if you relocate bats, let's say you, we box them up, uh, you know, a special uh, bat expert comes out, boxes them up, moves them five miles away, the bats will just fly back five miles away. Hmm. Uh- one of the things you might put on your website is what Paul Cox just put on my call screen, which uh, just made it real for me. He said, bats pollinate agave plants. No bats, no tequila. No bats, well, we no all, tequila. That's we your... all have that. <laughs> There's your theme. We all have that on our website. <laughs> no bats, no tequila. Oh, okay. So he got it from somewhere. Uh, that seems to be a very effective campaign. Um, a very real service they provide humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, good luck. I hope the bats return. Uh, let's have uh, Katie join us now. She's calling in from Lakewood. Hello there, Katie. Hi. Hi. You're on the air. So I, um, I'm not a biologist or anything, but I volunteer a lot for wildlife rehab, and I know that we have to treat that sort of special um, as rabies vectors, and their immune systems are really different. So I was wondering with all these experts if you guys could explain um, why bats are so different in their immune systems as an old order of mammals. Let's get to the immune system part second, but I, you mentioned rabies, and I wanted to get to that first because we're talking about some of the misconceptions as well. One of them was the idea of vampire bats, and we heard there are only three species. They're all in uh, uh, South America or Latin America. I'm not sure exactly, but they're not, they're not here. Uh, uh, Harvey, what about the idea that bats have rabies? That's, you know, that's what your parents said. Stay away from bats. They have rabies. No. You know, look at any any mammal can can contract rabies, and um, bats are no exception. Bats get a really bad rap as a being this huge vector of rabies. Um, you know, it could be that the, your neighborhood skunks are far more likely to be transmitting the disease because if in fact a bat gets rabies, it be, it's not necessarily aggressive. You might find it flopping on the ground. There might be a greater chance of human bat interaction, but the fact of the matter is, it's not necessarily going out of your way. That said, you take rabies always seriously, and if you ever are um, bitten by any any mammal, then uh, you should seek treatment, and you don't have to get the shots in the belly anymore. It's shots in the arm. It's a, I won't say it's painless, but it's a pretty straightforward way of, of being protected from rabies. Okay. But but that, that fear, the, the trouble is, is that if everybody regards every bat as rabid, then if you do have, you know, a maternity colony in your house or something, you know, people are inclined to just you know, destroy it and destroy all the bats. And that's a real shame because I don't think they're really that much risk than many other mammals that we come in contact with. Katie, uh, before putting a point on that, correct me, because I, I mentioned there are three, you said there were three bat uh, species that are that are uh, uh, blood-eating species. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. sanguivorous is the term, actually, for okay. that. I knew, um, I yeah, knew it. three species. <laughs> you knew it. Yeah, three species, and uh, they're they're not found here in North America. Excuse me, I keep saying North America. They're not found here in the U.S., although with climate change, we may see some um, range shifting over time. But they're just found in Latin America. Two species are uh, focused on birds and prey on them, and only one species focuses on mammals. Okay, I just wanted to clear that up because you said it right, and I think I, I trampled all over that. But Latin America, okay. So what Latin about this America. other What about this other part about the uh, the bats' immune systems and how they might be different? Yeah, that's actually a really fascinating area of research right now. Um, we we are finding actually that bats are are you know kind of associated with some of these uh, interesting diseases. 
you know, like Ebola, that, that was big, and MERS and Hendra, SARS, all of these. Um, and people have been starting to ask why. Why are that um, related to these, you know, these terrible viruses? Well, and it, it, it's really kind of boiling down to the interesting ecology that bats have, right? So bats are the only mammals capable of true flight, and many bats uh, form large congregations, you know, huge colonies. So, so they're, they're living in very close proximity to many other bats, and that kind of creates this recipe for this ability to withstand some some really you know interesting viruses and, and have those able to maintain in their population. So because they kind of maintain this elevated body temperature, uh, that elevated body temperature is not conducive to some more minor viruses. But it, think of it as like maybe only the very strongest viruses survive in that temperature. And so yeah, they are they are implicated in that. But but I don't think that that means that we should then, you know, eradicate that. And we have a lot to learn from that, right? Because humans are also starting to live in very dense uh, groups with a lot of uh, interaction. You know, think about big cities like, um, you know, like Hong Kong or Shanghai or something where there's huge concentrations of humans. We might have a lot to learn about uh, disease transmission and uh, the, the life of viruses just by studying how bats maintain them. Let's talk a little bit about the kinds of bats we see here, Harvey, as we are ready to wrap up the show. You mentioned big brown, big brown bats. Those are kind of like the, they're the urban bats. They're the ones that you generally associate with being hanging off of your, the eaves of your house. But right or not exclusively, no? but, okay. but a lot of you know sometimes people call them ubiquitous urban bats because you know they they, they have an affinity for for human structures. But we have. Um, the I think we mentioned before the little brown bat, a little brown myotis, used to be considered our most common bat, but it's one of the bats that's been heavily impacted by West no, uh, by um, white, white nose. nose syndrome, right? Getting onto another uh, virus <laughs> that right. breeds the town. Um, well, I keep saying white white noise syndrome, which it isn't. It's white nose syndrome. Yeah, we've got um, tricolors. We've got Indiana bats and endangered species. We've got long-eared, which are I think recently been listed as a, a threatened species. Um, uh, silver-haired bats. Um, there have been a couple occasions of three, I think, of the eastern small-footed, one in Boston Township in 2012. And then two of the highly migratory bats, the hoary and the red bat. And if, if people think, you know, it's, it's interesting when people think, say that bats are ugly, certainly these insectivorous um, bats have got rather unique faces that perhaps only a mother bat could love. <laughs> but when you take a look at um, the red bat, it is this big, comparatively large-bodied bat, it has this luxuriant, um, lustrous red fur. The males are redder than the females, and it's a really handsome creature, you know, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot to be said to that. So we say we have 11 bats in Ohio. We have um, maybe as many as nine in the northeast Ohio area. It's amazing that the little brown bat was the most ubiquitous, and now uh, it's, uh, it's really just been uh, reduced to, to such small numbers because of this particular white nose syndrome. We're going to have to wrap up our conversation now, though. Terrific uh, insights and education. Katie Gillies, thanks so much for being with us from Bat Conservation International. Appreciate the education this morning. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you as well, Rob Myas from the Organization for Bat Conservation. Thanks so much for being with us from Michigan today. My pleasure. And, of course, Harvey, always good to borrow you from, uh, from the sound of applause. Thanks for being with us this morning. <laughs>